Welcome once again to Military Motor Pool. I'm Tom Townsend, and this is a program all about military vehicles. Collecting, restoring, and keeping them rolling. Because when we preserve some of these, we're not just preserving bits of history, we're honoring the men and the women of all nations who had the courage to ride them into harm's way. World War II was the first truly mobile war. The trenches and static defenses of the Great War were mostly gone. The horse had become obsolete, and entire armies moved on the internal combustion engine. The military vehicle had become the new war horse. Thousands upon thousands of Jeeps and Dodges, Jimmies, Internationals, moved the millions of tons of everything from ammunition to rations and toilet paper. And with these massive and always hurried movements came the potential for monumental traffic jams. When the U.S. Army moved, more often than not, the responsibility for keeping these convoys rolling fell to the military police and their Harley-Davidson WLA motorcycles. Now to help us tell the story of these classic bikes is Kent Mad Dog Chipman, who just happens to own this WLA, which incidentally won the MVPA Restored Motorcycle Class in 2004, he won the Master's Class in 2006, and was inducted into the Military Vehicle Hall of Fame in 2010. <coughs> so we figure he ought to be able to get it right. Kent, welcome to Military Motor Pool. Thank you, sir, for having me. It's an honor. Kent, what exactly does WLA stand for? WL was a civilian version of this motorcycle. W meant 45 cubic inch, which is 750 cc. The L was high compression, and then the A is WLA Army. So it's a WLA. Harley Davidson was already an American icon long before the first WLA rolled off the assembly line in 1940. So they modified a civilian model to make this. What modifications did the military require? It was basically a civilian bike with an add-on military. The fenders were cut down so mud wouldn't accumulate between the tire and the fender. They had the machine gun scabbard and the ammo box and then, of course, the blackout lights for uh, convoy control at night. These are an extremely rare military vehicle today. How many of them did they make? Total, 57,000 were made, which the majority went to Russia, like 27,000. The U.S. only uh, received about 23,000. Our Lynn Lees went to all of our allies during the war, Australia, China. China received about 1,000, Australia about 4,200. Some went to Brazil. I noticed when you rode in, the controls on this bike look a lot different and a lot more complicated than modern bikes. Can you uh, walk us through the startup and the driving procedure on this? This is a little different than a modern motorcycle. It has a foot clutch with hand shift. It's a six volt system, kick start only, so you had to keep it in tune good or she might be a little harder to start than modern vehicles. Now any military vehicle needs to be extremely self-sufficient in combat. I notice this bike carries a lot of gear can you tell us uh, what some of this equipment's for? Well, the GI in the field had to be pretty much self-sufficient, relied on itself. He would carry his sleeping gear, which consisted of a pup tent. Uh, I have a 1942 Sears and Roebuck pup tent. Everything on here is 42 dated is what I tried to find, 42 blanket. You had all the tools that were required to do minor surgery on the motorcycle. Also had spare parts, bulbs, and then, of course, you had you had to have <clears throat> had to have your ammo and your weapon and probably a field stove, a single burner stove, and his mess kit. And what's the top speed and range? 
The top speed is listed in the manual, 65 miles per hour, but this was the fastest vehicle during World War II. It would probably do at least 75 miles an hour. It had a cruising range of approximately 100 miles. It held three gallons, a little over three gallons of gas, and got about 35 miles per gallon. WLAs earned the nickname Liberator. Do you know where that came from? Yes, the GI, usually scout recon guys would get ahead and would be the first ones into the occupied country. Checkmate King 2, Swat Rook over. Checkmate King 2, Swat Rook over. German spotted in the open. Asmus 87915, fire for effect, fire for effect, out. And the, uh, the French and the Belgians nicknamed them the Liberators because they liberated them from the Germans. It began actually in World War I. Uh, Corporal Holtz was the first American in the Germany riding his Harley Davidson. And then during World War II into Belgium, uh, a GI got ahead of the tank destroyer group and he didn't realize he was so far ahead of the lines and he scooted back. But to, and starting in 2009, they do an annual. Uh, appreciation for him. They, they built a monument and they do a ceremony every year in honor of this gentleman riding his Army Harley. Mm -hmm. I know very few, if any, sidecars were built for the Harley Davidsons, uh, possibly because the U.S. Army never really thought of these as combat vehicles, at least in the same sense that, say, the German Army did, where you usually see the BMW with a sidecar and a machine gun on it. But yet these were used for reconnaissance. Correct. The you, issued to the U.S. soldier, there was never a sidecar on the WLA Army Harley. But they uh, put them on the Russian motorcycles on the Lynn Lease program, the thousands that went to them. What were the primary missions of the WLA? The WLA had a lot of different missions. One was the convoy control, traffic control, uh, dispatch, escort service, uh, MP duties. Didn't Harley-Davidson build more WLAs after the war? Yes, there were post-World War II WLAs, 1949, 50, 51, and 52, and they're very rare. The, the 50s, they made like 25 of them, and 10 of them went to the Connecticut State Guard, so they're very rare. Well, that's about all the time we have today. Ken, thanks so much for allowing us to show off your very beautiful motorcycle. Thank you, sir. It's time to ride. Harley-Davidson would go on to build other bikes for the military. In 1987, they began production on the MT350E. This is a lightweight off-road bike which saw service primarily with British and Canadian forces, and a few are still in use today.
History is filled with ghost stories. Battlefields, military cemeteries, old warships, they all seem to have their resident ghost. And there are those who believe that restless spirits may haunt some military vehicles. <laughs> well, now I don't know about that, but when we come back, we're gonna ask the experts. It's easy to become so involved in the restoration and maintenance of these vehicles that we sometimes forget about the places they went, and the battles they survived, not to mention the people who fought and died in them. This is partly because it's usually almost impossible to trace a vehicle's service history. Serial numbers and hood numbers tell us when and usually where it was manufactured, but they say nothing about it where it went once it left the factory. Bumper markings are better, as they denote a particular unit to which the vehicle was assigned at some point in time. The problem with them usually is recovering them from beneath layers and layers of olive draft paint. So more often than not, there simply is no starting point to trace a history from. Within this collection, there are only five vehicles that I have even a partial service history on. We know, for example, that this CCKW arrived in Germany in the spring of 1945, that it served with the United States Army until after the end of the war, and then after a short time with the Belgian Army, went into NATO storage, where it spent the next 40 or so years before being purchased by an American collector. According to a former owner, this weapons carrier hit the beach at Normandy on about the 10th of June, 1944, and chased Nazis all the way to Berlin. This ferret still carries some scars, most likely earned on the streets of Belfast in Northern Ireland. All of these have been to places where bad things happened. So when somebody suggested there might be a ghost in one of them, <laughs> well, after we had a good laugh, I got to thinking, and this place does get a little creepy at night, so why not? Graveyards, battlefields, old warships all have reputations for being haunted. So why not military vehicles? We thought it might be interesting to find out. And so we invited our friends, Sheila and Marlon Williams, from the internet television show Spirit Quest to bring their ghost hunting skills and have a serious look at the possibility of haunted military vehicles. Sheila, Marlon, welcome to Military Motor Pool. Tom, good to see you again. So Tom, um, I understand that you're experiencing some type of paranormal activity, so can you kind of walk us through and tell us what's going on? Most of it seems to have emanated, or at least according to people who have spent the night out here, they seem to hear someone who gets out of this ambulance or maybe something close to this ambulance and walks around. He doesn't seem to be angry with anybody or anything, mm -hmm. but uh, so that's, that's most of footsteps. it. footsteps. Footsteps, yeah. Mm -hmm. I heard them... Um, I was working out here one winter way back in that corner and uh, I thought I had cows bumping against the outside of the building and I went out and there weren't any cows there. And uh, so I walked around and didn't see anything. As soon as I went back to work, I'd hear the footsteps again. I didn't think a great deal about it then, but um, later some groups of reenactors were spending the night out here in the museum. and. Uh, they begin to talk about hearing somebody walking around and seem to believe it came out of the ambulance here. Right. I've always been aware that there were scars on this side of the armor from either small arms or shrapnel hits. Mm -hmm. And I, from her motor records, I was pretty sure that, that her uh, last tour of duty was in Northern Ireland. But just last winter, I took off a service light from inside mm -hmm. and uh, it had never been removed before although the interior had been painted many times and behind it was thick dried blood and so my guess is that uh, probably in, in Northern Ireland the driver was killed mm -hmm. with shots through this vision port uh, which would have lined up pretty well with the other side mm -hmm. there and where that was and of course when they went in and cleaned up and repainted there was no reason to look behind that light, so no one did. You know, we'll do our best get with the evidence to see, you know, if there is some spirit energy still attached to it. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe have some answers for you.
is still attached to this ambulance. Can you tell us your name, please? Why do you stay here? I just caught something moving up in front of the camera. I'm not sure what it is. At 28 minutes, 50 seconds. That's a strong yes. Hi, David. Can you speak into that digital recorder and say your name? <laughs> Tell us your first name. Uh, I may be wrong about this. Was your was your dad's name Tom also? Yeah. Okay. That's what I just picked up. It was Tom or Thomas. Yeah. Okay. What are you still doing hanging around okay. here? I'm like getting total chills right now. Yeah. Can you give us your name? My name is Sheila and this is Marlon. No one is here to harm you. Tom invited us here to make contact and just find out some more information about you. Are you still here? I heard a tap. I heard the tap. If that is you, tap twice, please. to anyone that is still attached to this tank. Well, if I didn't catch anything in here, then it's still a great experience. I don't know if I can get out. Alright. Alright. Well, that certainly was a very interesting night. We've now given the Spirit Quest team enough time to analyze the evidence they found. And, well, Sheila, we all saw and heard uh, some pretty weird stuff. Can you make some sense out of it for us? I think we can, Tom. We did capture some EVPs that night. That's electronic voice phenomenon. And they were centered around the ferret and the ambulance. And I'd like to share those with you. All right, Tom, this one was captured at the back of the ambulance. I had set up my digital voice recorder there at the back of the ambulance, and this is what we captured. Hello. Hello. Can you hear that whisper? You say, come on in, come on in. Yeah. Okay, and then I'm gonna isolate that so it um, blocks out all that other noise for you. So we thought that one was pretty fascinating. All right, Tom, this one was captured behind the ambulance as well. And I'll let you hear it and see what you think it says. You hear that voice? Are you saying, I'll poke or I'll poke you? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and isolate just that portion for you. Yeah, 
Yeah, that one's pretty wild. Pretty that's weird, very, isn't it? That's very strange. I'm not even sure that's what he's saying, but I'm, I'm thinking maybe we're mistranslating that. Now, Tom, not only were we able to pick up some interesting visuals with the camera, but we were also uh, able to pick up an EVP, and I think you'll find this one quite interesting right here. I'm going to play it for you right now. Tom, we found it really interesting that this uh, EVP had an accent. Isn't this a British-made vehicle? Yes, and it was, as far as we know, it was in British service um, all during its, its service career. So it definitely would have been someone with a British accent in there. And, uh, you know, as we said, we're fairly certain that the driver was shot uh, through the left side vision port, hit in the head. Um, so. Yeah, there's no question this, this was in some bad places, most likely Belfast and Northern Ireland the last time. Um, so yeah, very, very much in keeping with, with what would have been said inside a ferret. Well, so are they haunted? Well, Tom, I think you have some paranormal activity attached to your vehicles. So um, with the evidence that we did capture, um, I don't know who they are, but they certainly aren't harmful or here to hurt you in any way, so just keep your eyes open. If you'd like to see more of the footage from this investigation, just go to our website for a link at militarymotorpool.tv. So until next time, from all the staff at Military Motor Pool, so long and let's keep them rolling.